This intro probably took the most retakes of any intro that I've ever done. So I'm, I'm done redoing the intro. This is going to be it. This is going to be the final one. I want to summarize this a little bit. I want to leave you on a cliffhanger. I want to make you think. And the way I'm going to do that is how many collect calls have you made? How many collect phone calls have you made? And what were the circumstances of that phone call? And who was that phone call to? Was that phone call to your parents? Did your parents live in the same country that you were when you made that phone call? And was the dialogue of that phone call, was it to the extent that you were telling them that you're in such a dire situation that it was a matter of sacrificing your mental health or sacrificing your life? Because I've maybe made two collect phone calls. And the context of my collect phone call was I just had to let them know that I got to church on time. Perspective. I hope you enjoy this episode. It was a good one. Welcome to the Lifestyle Chase Season 2. This podcast features high performers who have found a way to live their best life while balancing their health, wellness, friends, and family. I'm your host, Chris Little. Let's get started. The Lifestyle Chase is brought to you by Yeg Fitness. Yeg Fitness is Edmonton, Alberta, Canada's healthy lifestyle community, creating and supporting active living for all. Check them out online at yegfitness.ca and on social media at Yeg Fitness. This is episode 72 with Namrata Gill. I tried my best to say that. (laughs) You did just fine. And you know something? That's all I can ask for. And it's Namrata. And, you know, we just roll our R's a little bit more. So it's absolutely fine. Thank you. Awesome. How's your morning going so far? So far, so good. You know, it's um, just a working night. So I get, get to sleep in. And then I just plan out my day accordingly. So, so far it's been not too bad. Have you always worked nights like that? Or is this like a new thing or? It's uh, just my, with my job. Yeah. It's shift work. Okay. So uh, I think there was a very short time where I haven't worked nights. Okay. But uh, I do prefer nights to days. How come? I don't know. It's just, even with nights, I find even if I sleep six hours or seven hours, it's still enough. But with day shift, especially the where I'm working right now. I work, uh, I start work at 4.30 in the morning. So I'm usually up by 2.30. And that is really hard on body, I find. Whereas when I work nights, I work 4.30 again till 4.30 a.m. And even if I'm up by 12, I'm like, I'm pretty good to go. But I find, especially with now winter coming and days getting so short. So when I'm going to work in, whether it's daytime or nighttime, it's dark when I'm coming home it's dark but with day shift it just feels like a very long day because by the time I get home it's usually 5 five thirty ish and then I don't have any energy to do anything okay yeah I always get curious about that kind of stuff because I know like working through the night can really like mess somebody's sleep cycle up oh it does my okay. sleep cycle is pretty messed up. And <laughs> <laughs> like even when I like I just came back from India and it took me good 10 days to kind of get into a routine. And by the time I got into a routine of like having a proper sleep at night and getting up at a you know, reasonable hour that the whole world gets up at, it was time to come back. Yeah. So, yeah. But <laughs> I know. You know, they do say the shift work is really hard on human body and most shift workers, they say, it takes off, knocks off about seven years from your life span. Yeah. So, it is not for everybody. I. And as I get older, I find that it is. I feel it more. Yeah. And especially like, my my shift pattern doesn't have the switch over from days to nights, and nights to days. So if I finish on Friday morning, on Monday morning I'm going back to day shift so that switch over is really tough but you know it's a it's my it's I choose to do this job and yeah I love it yeah 
I won't change it. So those are some sacrifices we all have to make, like nurses do it, cops do it, you know, other shift workers do it. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. And even like just with trainers, like a lot of people, like the gym was full of trainers yesterday. Yeah. And people are like, well, it's a holiday. I was like, well, if our clients want to train, we're going to be in here. Like, Absol- this is what we do. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, uh, we have access to a gym. So I tried my level best whether it's night shift or day shift, that when I I have my lunch time, I'm fortunate enough to work in an area where I can use my lunch hour to go work out. Yeah. So I like to do that. Like, as I said before, I'd gone to India. So I had gone without actually working out for nearly six weeks. And then I came back and after the first week of jet lag, I got back into the gym and my legs were so sore. So I worked Sunday night and all I did Sunday night was get into the gym at, even though I was super tired and my legs were stiff, I just decided I'm just going to roll them. Yeah. Like I spent late, nearly an hour just rolling them out, stretching them out. And that itself made such a big difference. So, you know, like, and I think that is so important, like physical activity, you know, like you, we are starting to recognize it. But I think that's for me, I recognize it that if I don't uh, get into some form of physical activity, whether it's like I recently started spinning, I work out at work, I was doing yoga, I find that it does affect me mentally too, and then mm-hmm. it affects my work, and then if it, it affects my sleep pattern too. So that helps me. Makes to, sense. Yeah. So. Aside from fitness, aside from nutrition, in any given week, what's something that you need to have for consistency to sort of feel grounded? Oh, that's a great question. I think for myself, it's music. I really like to listen to a lot of Indian music. I listen to all kinds of music, yeah. except for rock. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I've listened to that sometimes when I'm driving to work at like three o'clock in the morning and I just need that waking up but I find music I listen I will have it playing at home Um, my daughter recently gave me a beautiful birthday present and it's got about 5,000 of Indian songs and they're from like the 50s the 60s the 70s 80s to all the way to now and I will just start listening to it and I just find that like there's so much going on at work and just the work stress and then recently I've had some personal stress going on it just brings some kind of calmness to me yeah and the music is so beautiful music is so soothing and I think it's really it can be food for your soul like if you find the right song yeah right so that's what I like to do and then there are days when I just like to wedge on my couch with yeah. Netflix. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So with music, I find that a lot of people associate music with like certain moments in their life or memories, stuff like that. When you think of like the songs, your go-to songs, the songs you could play all day, every day, um, what kind of a memory or a moment do you associate with those kind of songs or what, what stands out to you about music where it's like, yeah, this is the one. Oh, I think for me, it's such different moments in my life. And it's really interesting, Chris, like when I was living in India, as I was growing up, I never listened to Indian music because we were always listening to Western music. We used to have tapes or we used to have radios like, you know, listening to George Michael used to be big when I was growing up you know Wham used to be big but I knew about the Indian music because we watched Indian movies but I find since I came to Canada I think it reminds me of home yeah it uh, reminds me of a moment certain movie song that maybe um, when my dad was in the army and was posted at a certain place it reminds me of um, my school days you know some uh, some songs um, remind me of my school days with my friends and our school trips because they are reminiscent of that so I think you know 
those are the songs. And then, there, of course, there's the usual love songs, the romance songs that some bring back really happy memories. And then there are some that you play when you need uh, some letting go. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. yeah. So those are the things that, for me, that's what music does. So I like that uh, you say you associate a lot of like the Indian music with like growing up there, and that kind of gets me curious about like what was life like growing up there. Like, what were the three things that stood out the most to you that are like your your memories that kind of stand out, whether they be happy or sad or whatever they are. Oh, I think one of the things that really stood out for me which actually reflected reflected in my choice of my career too is that the fact that my dad was in the army and being in the arm um, the armed forces are very well a uh, lot of um, people in India respect the armed forces at least when we were growing up uh, my dad was an officer and every two years he would get transferred to a new place so we would move every two years, two to three years. Um, you know, it's hard sometimes making new friends, but I think we also had the security of the army life and meeting liked mind, like the same uh, people that ha were having the same experiences. So we kind of connected on that, where you were like, yeah, I understand your dad's in the army too. Um, and in those days, when I was growing up, it, Indian Army was only for men. So women came much later, except if you were a doctor. So, you know, that's what reminds me of that. Like, having the privilege, because of my dad being in the Army, to visit pl different places in India. India is such a vast country, just like Canada is, where as you know, if you want to go visit the East Coast, you know, if you have a family and stuff, you have to ten times think about it because it's so expensive. Yeah. But whereas us being in the army, we got to visit different places, different states. Uh, the only place um, which I still haven't visited in India is the Southern India, which I would like to one day. So that's one thing. I think the other thing would be the loss of friendships that you made and in those days there was no social media that you could keep up so there yeah. was just letters yeah and unless you were really tight you know over time um you you couldn't keep in touch and i think that's one thing that social media has done so well is for me to reconnect to some of my friends from my childhood yeah just on like facebook or instagram and the third thing, oh. I think it... I think if I had been in India, I think the opportunities that I've had in my life in Canada, I can, I can recognize that, that I would not be able to have them if I had lived in India in those days, still lived in India. Yeah. Because India has changed a lot, but um, my life circumstances would not have let me have a successful life that I can have over here. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, I, I can, I'm cognizant of that fact. So what was life like when you moved to Canada? Like what was what was happening during that time? I think my my life, like you know, I I I my came to Canada because I had an arranged marriage, and by the virtue of marriage, I migrated to Canada, and I was only nineteen, going on twenty. Um, you know, you have these. You're like you know you're still young and life hasn't jaded you yet so you have these beliefs that you know marriage is going to be all hunky dory life is going to be great and I came with like such great 
I had lots of dreams, you know, that I was going to come to Canada because Canada was a progressive country where, you know, I'll be able to live life the way I want to and I'll have a husband that'll be supportive of that. Um, unfortunately, that was not the case. Um, it was an arranged marriage, but, you know, um, there are thousands of arranged marriages which are very successful, which are, you know, the partners are respectful of each other, care for each other, but unfortunately that wasn't the case. Um, I was actually doing my Bachelor of Arts in, uh, in, 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 in India when I got married, so I thought I would go back to school here. Uh, but um, when I got here, m my ex-husband now decided that I should work in the business that he owned uh, as a cashier. And the thing was that I came in November, um, so and not knowing the education system here, he said, "Oh, the schools don't start till next September, so we have time. You know, you can go. We can think about it closer to that time." And you know you want to you want to trust your husband because he knows and he's been living here for years. And um, so I started working in the store, and then shortly after that I got pregnant, and so so that kind of put schooling to the back burner. And even though I like don't get me wrong, I'm really truly blessed to have my daughter but you know I wasn't ready to be a mother at that time mm -hmm. but that was the only option I had um, shortly after that like like you know you he was uh, he he started like he started making he started changing he made started making demands he wanted my parents to give more money um, you know I wanted to sponsor my parents to come to Canada and he said oh yeah yeah we'll sponsor your parents but you know they need to give me you know to show them we they'll have money here so they need to give me money so my dad ended up giving him about thirty thousand dollars in 1991-92 and you know that's quite a lot of money even today so but in those days it was quite a big um, and then my daughter was born and it was almost instantly things got worse because I had a daughter and it, to me it was very strange because my parents only have two daughters and with both mine and my sister's birth my dad had already always celebrated he'd never made us feel that we were any less than a boy or anything like that and then shortly after that my ex-mother-in-law and my ex-sister-in-law also migrated to Canada and um, things got progressively worse at home so it was it was very difficult for me to recognize why this was happening like I was I was able to speak the language it wasn't like you know uh, that I did not know how to speak English um, I knew to call 911 because I worked in a store. So if, you know, there wasn't any theft or anything like that, I knew to call 911 for that. But I did not know that I could call 911 to tell what was happening to me. And then, of course, this was early 90s and, you know, I've just come from India where, you know, you, you're still, you've been brought up to believe that, you know, um, don't do anything to bring shame to your family. Like, even though if my parents did not say it directly to me, but that was the atmosphere I grew up in. That was uh, the surroundings I grew up in. So, like, I wasn't sure what to do. Like, who do I reach out to? I didn't have any, like, my ex-husband had friends that were all his age, and no there was nobody that was my age so i wasn't able to interact with anybody on one on one just by myself either and don't get me wrong there were good days there were a lot of good days and then there were a lot of bad days 
but there was a lot of control happening which was subtle control sometimes like my and and I know people will find it so silly but my ex mother-in-law would walk into the room but she would have her face covered because she did not want to see my face the first thing in the morning because that would ruin the rest of her day or um on I remember washing my hair on a Tuesday one time and my mother-in-law threw a fit called me names called my mother names saying your you know your family hasn't taught you anything don't you know women are married women are not supposed to wash their hairs on Tuesdays because that leads to their husbands dying makes it's I know it's not logical and trust me I've washed my hair on Tuesdays ever since he's still apparently living so <laughs> it hasn't had any effect but I think when you are young you're kind of isolated you're alone and you start kind of these kind of things start you know affecting you mentally because you don't know who you can trust who you can talk to and and when your like your movements are controlled like look i want like i remember uh, we used to have this police officer that used to come to the store and i was like oh i want to be a police officer and he would be like what do you want like not the police officer my ex would say no you don't want to be a police officer we have a business to run and you can't be a police officer you don't have what it takes to be a police officer so even though i had that in my mind but then i had this person who was supposed to you know support me what i wanted to do in life telling me no you can't do this and of course i had a baby by then so it was like okay but i but i do remember like slowly how my self esteem not only my self esteem and self respect got eroded mentally i think i got to the point where i really thought i was a nobody and i still remember like after um one of uh, one of the brutal attacks like i he uh, that he assaulted me and i think that was the assault where i that night there was something that shifted in me that was like you know something i might as well be dead like what's the point of living like this but i did not have the courage to make a decision by myself but that was like you know quite a few years ago so i phoned my father i phoned my parents actually and i made a collect call because i did not want him to know that i had called my parents and i still remember telling my father i said like you know you have married me to this person and i really don't want to do anything that will cause any kind of shame for the family however i can tell you one thing that you know you guys need to do something because otherwise either i'm going to be dead or i am going to be in a mental institution like those are the two th- those were the two only options that i could see and i don't i think that phone call had a great impact on my family because they knew things were bad but they didn't realize how bad they were because obviously you don't tell them everything and that i think was in 97 i think it was april of uh, 97 because my ex husband had just come back from india and he'd gone to india and he tried to you know um get my parents to give him more money and my parents had outrightly refused so i think that was his excuse for assaulting me when he came back um it was not just a physical assault um he had actually tried to um sexually assault me that night because he'd come back from india and he felt you know it was my wifely duties to perform you know but i i don't know I don't know what it was that night that I said, you know, you can hit me as much as you want, you can do whatever you want. 
I'm not giving in to you today. And that's after that is when I made the call to my parents. And um, I have to really um, give credit to my family that they really stepped up. Um, it took my dad about a month because he was still working. He could retire, so he went ahead and he put his retirement papers in. He went and got a visa to come to Canada. And he did come. He, my father showed up. He said, okay, like, you know, I can talk. Like, you know, marriage is like a house. You know, when you build a house, it's a, the foundation has to be really strong because otherwise it crumbles. And building a house takes time and effort. So just like, you know, marriage takes time and effort and you have to, both sides have to be willing to contribute towards it to make it work. And in India, there's a saying, you know, marriage is not a game of, you know, you're not playing um, dollhouse where, you know, one day you'll stay and then next day you'll leave or then you'll come back again. So my dad was very clear, he said, I will support you in whatever decision you want to make, but we should at least try to see if this is salvageable. I said, okay. So, because, you know, my dad still did not know what kind of people we were dealing with. And my father tried to talk to my ex and his mother and his sister, and they were very clear. They said, if she wants to live in this house, she has to live according to the way we want her to live. Otherwise, there's the door kind of thing. So my dad said, okay. If that's the way you want to be, then that's fine. Um, and my dad said, and then me and my dad took me for a walk and he was like, you know, ultimately it has to be your decision because tomorrow I don't want you to turn around and say to me that however bad it was or however it was, at least I had a husband, I had a family, right? And I said, no. I'm done. I, and I, but I turned around and said to my dad, I said, if they come begging tomorrow and saying, we are sorry, you know, we want her back. I don't want you to say that you should give them another chance either. And he said, no. So then my father was the one who went to the Edmonton Police Service. He contacted them. And um, then um, the police came and that's how I left. But from 91, I arrived in um, November of 91, and I left June of 97. And my dad still would say that the girl that he married and put on a plane in India and the girl that he came to visit when all this was happening was two different people. It wasn't the same person. So it wasn't, um, you know, um, it wasn't the most pleasant experience coming to Canada, but I have to say that the life that Canada has given me, uh, it has been, I, I'm very grateful and I, I, I feel that I have a successful life. Mm -hmm. I have a good life. I'm living life on my terms and I think that to me, um, like people will always ask me, did he ever go to jail? Did you ever, um, you know, lay charges? And I say, you know something, I, and I know I work in our legal system. However, for me, it wasn't about sending him to jail. It wasn't about him going to jail. It wasn't him even accepting what he did to me. To me, it was that I can give myself and my daughter a life that where we don't have to walk on eggshells. And the biggest thing for me was I did not want my daughter growing up in a household where she thought women were second class citizens or to be, to be treated like that was okay. Because if I stayed, and a lot of women stay, but that's the decision. That's the right decision for them. That's the decision they have to make for themselves. But for me, it wasn't. Um, I just didn't want her to think that was a normal. That's what a normal relationship is. It's not. So th I think she was, she is, and always has been uh, my inspiration to do anything that I do in my life. 
and amazingly she's my hero now you know she just she i don't know how she does it but she lives her life on her own terms she's a young indian girl living in india and following her dream and i'm like i don't know how you do it but you know so i i think i just wanted to i know it gave me a good life too in return but it was for her mhm yeah so when it comes to your daughter what are the three things that you admire the most about her oh i don't know if i can narrow down to three things but i'll try <laughs> um you know there's some people that are old souls and they have without even having lived like you know life for that long they have this knowledge or they have this wisdom and she's one of those people i wouldn't say she's an old soul but she's quite wise for her age mhm she always has been i admire the fact that she was very uh from a very young age she knew that she wanted to be she she was very creative at first she wanted to be an actress and she knew that she wanted to go to bollywood and you know she never wavered in that and when after she finished high school here she went to mumbai she was 18 she was going into a city where um we knew nobody at least when i was coming to canada i was coming to a husband like she was going to a, the city where we had no connections we did not know anybody but she never even if she was scared she never showed it to me that i was scared that you know and i'm sure she was um that she has that conviction to follow her dreams like i would think 10 times i'd be like oh my god uh how will i do this how will i pay this bill or how would i do that you know i would be scared to start my life all over again but she's like no this is it might take me 5 years it might take me 10 years but i'm going to keep working at it the other thing that i find that i really admire about her that she doesn't compromise her morals for anything she has this dream to be successful in bollywood and she has faced a lot of what we would call casting couch or you know it would be very easy like you know but she would not compromise um she's gone to auditions where she's been propositioned and like you know she hasn't given me the whole scope of it but she's mentioned things and you go for auditions and they look you up and down and they pick on things you know mm-hmm. i think that's so strong to keep showing up every day after getting rejected because or oh, your hair is not right or your body type is not right or your skin color is not right because that would really do a number i know it would do a number on me like you know like what do you mean so she doesn't let that you know your somebody else's idea of what she's lacking affect her mhm and she has like you know she's been there since 2018 and in the last a few years she's changed course from wanting to be an actress to be a director i you know i admire the fact that she she writes she wrote her first short film she directed it and when i saw the film it was actually premiered at last year at the edmonton international film festival and i did not know that she was a writer and act, actually a funny one like she wrote this short film which was so funny and i was like so like i admire her that you know she's not scared of trying new things like you know i i don't know i got blessed somewhere along the way to have her as my daughter yeah yeah i think that's really cool 
And I think when it comes down to it, like a lot of the people, if I like take a list of people and I pick out the people that uh, stand out or the people that are admired or the people that uh, somebody's like, I want to be like that person. And like more often than not, they had to go through like some dark, dark places and they had to face moments in their life where they were like, I don't know how I'm going to get past this. Absolutely. And then what life looks like when they do is that's what people are envious of. And it's like you have to, as like this person that sees what somebody else has and wants, you have to understand like you have to pay a price to, to have like these victories, to like just imagine being like an up and coming like writer. And then they're like, oh, I want to be a writer. And it's like, well, you know, do you want to pay the price that she had to pay to get to that point? And do you have that dedication to sit down every day and write something? You know, I, I, um, I think like when she was modeling and stuff, she ended up meeting her current employer. And he took her in to become as an intern. And then she's gone on to become a very, um, like, you know, a paid employee there. She's like, she started off as the assistant to the director. Now she's an assistant director. And, you know, she's very, um, you know how social media is so, and it's social media is great. Don't get me wrong. She has social media, but she's not on social media. Like she'll occasionally post something that she feels is important. But I'll be like, sometimes I'll have these conversations with her where I'll be like, Anmol, you're in in this industry. You need to be on so- social media so people can, you know, they, they know you're doing all this work out there. And then she's, she's like, that's okay, mom. People that matter, that matter to see my work or know what work I'm doing, they know what I'm doing. Mm-hmm they don't need to see it on social media for them to recognize it so I'm like okay so like you know like to me that is like because she's like 26 now and I would say the last two or three years she's like she'll make a post every couple of months maybe and I'm like you need to be on social media more and and there's a 26 year old telling me no mom it's okay I don't know. Yeah. That is like some old soul um, stuff yeah. right there. Yeah. Like I have followed a lot of videographers that make their living doing uh, different. It's usually like influential videos representing a different brand or company. Yeah. And they get asked, it's like, well, how often did you post to get to the point where you can make your income? And it's like, well, it's not the stuff that you're seeing that brought me to make my income. Yeah. It's it's all of the, the direct contact and the relationship building and all the behind the scenes stuff. Like this is just like the tiny, tiny highlight reel. Yeah. And the same goes for trainers. Like you might have like a gut trainer that has this really glamorous like social media. Absolutely. But it's the it's the interning at gyms, it's like the free sessions, it's the hundreds of first client consultations where you just met the person and they couldn't afford to train with you, but you met them anyways. It's like all that behind the scenes stuff that amounts to something. Yeah. And I don't like people don't, uh, people just see the end product. Yeah. Right. Even when you take a picture and post it on Instagram or whatever your platform might be. And I know, like I know very little about social media. I might need to know a little bit about Snapchat filter or something. But there's a lot of editing that goes in. There's a lot of, you know, there are people that know what to target and all that. There's a lot of work that goes into that one picture before you see that picture, like, you know, before it's posted. And so people don't see all that. People just want to think that, oh, I'm going to post this stuff and it's going to be instantly liked. Yes, your friends are going to like it because we like to support each other. But to reach that level, you will have to give up a lot of other stuff to get there. And I don't think people sometimes recognize that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think we, maybe it's the times we are living in where we need that instant, everything needs to happen instantly. Like people think, um, I talk to a lot of uh, people 
who want to be police officers. So, okay, fine, I can be a police officer. I said, no, it's a lot of hard work. You have to go in, you have to be physically fit, you have to be mentally fit, you have to, you know, pass all this other stuff. Oh, okay. So, well, I go to the gym. Okay, what do you do? I do this. Okay, have you run? Because they'll take you for runs. Will you be able to keep up? So then they start recognizing, okay, I might need to do all this. Okay, how long will it take? Six months? I said, personally, for me, it took me at least a year. And that was just to meet the bare minimum. But if you, and people can meet the bare minimum. But if you want to be competitive, you need to do better than bare minimum. You Like, you know, so because there are other people that are going to do way better than you, then if you just meet the bare min- minimum standards, yes, you're meeting the minimum standards, but it, it might get you in. But then class will be that much harder because, you know, you'll have tough time keeping up. Mm-hmm. So then when you make them see that, some people get inspired by that and they say, okay, yeah, I'm serious about this. I want to do this. Then they go ahead and they commit to doing it. And others who you know that are, you know, they give it a try and then they they say, okay, this is not for me then, right? And honestly, when I joined, it it was, yeah, it was a lot of, it was a big challenge. I really thought like I was going to go in and I was going to do it and then it wasn't. It, it, um... I remember still like because as I said before like with my dad being in the army and then how the Edmonton Police Service ended up helping me it kind of reinforced me that I wanted to give something back to the community that was um, help like had helped me in such a to have a life yeah right like I remember uh, when EPS came to uh, uh, help me go to a shelter, and then for two years I did a child, my child exchange at a police station. So it just it was just that thing that how do I give back? Yeah. And then I remember, like, somebody said, okay. So, I've, like, I, first time I remember, I, I went and just wrote the exam. Oh, I'm going to be a police officer. I went and applied. I still remember going. I went from the shelter, actually, to apply to EPS. Um, I was wearing this oversized pink T-shirt. I was totally out of shape. Um, I had a long uh, black polka dotted skirt with pink flowers on it wearing flip-flops right I must have made a really great first impression walking into that recruiting uh, office and then they said oh they were really happy to see you know an East Indian female apply they said yes you should come back and write the exam you should write the exam I said okay like okay fine write the exam I you know went and wrote the exam and I failed miserably Um, because I had studied in India. Indian exam writing is so different from writing exams here. Uh, I wrote the exam, I think in 97 or 98, the f- 97 the first time. And I had been out of school. Uh, my brain really wasn't functioning at you know the way level it should have been functioning. But I was excited. I was excited to be a police officer. Um, so I failed my exam. Then I was like, oh, now what do I do? And then I found out, like, you know, then other uh, there other people that were supportive of me, they said, you know, like, you can't just put your eggs in one basket. You have to think. So I said, okay, fine. I'll have to go back to school. So I went back to school. I upgraded my sciences. And I decided that I was going to be a nurse. So I went into Grad McEwen nursing program. I... Um, between that I wrote my exam for the second time to get into the EPS and I failed again so I was like okay this is a sign this is a sign that I'm not supposed to be a police officer I'm supposed to be a nurse so I went and did my first year of nursing and um, I got blessed where 
as by, when I was finishing my first year of nursing, APS was going to run a program called Visible Minority Job Development Program. And they were looking at all these uh, applicants from different communities to see who would qualify for that program. So they gave me a call and they said, hey, we saw that you had applied. We see that, you know, you, there are certain things that you've not been able to. So how about, you know, we, so I was like, huh, I just finished first year of nursing. I kind of had it in my mind that I was going to be a nurse now. and But I went and spoke to my nursing instructors. And my, all my nursing instructors said, run away from nursing. And I'm looking at them going, aren't you supposed to actually encourage me to stay? And they're like, no, 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 run, run. If this is what you want to do, go do it. But, you know, then again, it was that um, I had to make a decision because visible minority job development program did not mean that I was going to be a police officer because that was just a seven month program. And after that, I had to do the application process. And if I didn't make it, then I would be literally losing a year of nursing again. But then I was like, I have to take a chance because mm -hmm. this is what my dream was. So which I did. And then I finished the visible minority job development program and I got into class into 99. Yeah, I got into class. I was like super excited. I was going to be in class and uh, September of 2000, September 11th, never forget that day uh, for different reasons too. Um, and class started and I was, I was struggling. If I was to be very honest, I wasn't at, like I'd met the bare minimums for physical standards. But I was struggling. I was struggling because I, since I had left my ex to get into EPS, I had not really taken time to reflect or get help from all the trauma that I had suffered. I was just on this mission that I needed to make a life for myself and my daughter and come what may, I was going to make a successful life. So I had buried all that. So when I went to class, I was really having a tough time. Firstly, like I was in the class, like we had to be in, at work like at six o'clock in the morning and sometimes I wasn't getting home till 10 at night. And I was really struggling with the fact that I was just a single parent at that time, newly single parent, still having custody issues and stuff. And that I wasn't seeing my daughter. Like I would drop her off at a friend who ran a daycare, who would take her to daycare and then pick her and pick her from her home because I had no family over here to support me. So that guilt was eating up at me. And mentally I wasn't in a place where I should, like, you know, I could have been an officer at all. And I remember it was our like EPS has every um, class has first few weeks they give you Fridays give you stress stress days which is like intense physical activity to stress you out you know to see how what level they can take you at so they break you down and then they build you up kind of thing and um, I remember the second Friday I was doing one of the exercises and my foot twisted and I broke, I fractured, fractured my foot. And um, I still remember, uh, at first I was very disappointed because I was like, oh crap, it's going to be like, I'm done. Like, you know, they're going to throw me out. I'm done. I mean, like I wasted a whole year. I have to go back to nursing now. And, you know, like, 110 things running through my mind. What am I going to do with my daughter? Like, you know, and also there was a little bit of maybe guilt and shame about, oh my God, I was, you know, really wanting this and make myself and my parents proud that I could be on my, stand on my own feet. But honestly, that fracture was one of the best things that could have ever happened. Because EPS did recognize that I was capable 
to being an officer. I just needed to work on certain things. So they kept me. They kept me as a recruit constable. They I worked in an office where I had a very uh, strict uh, protocols to follow. Like I had to be at the gym at 6.30 in the morning at Kinsman with my constable and my sergeant there to work out every day. Um, I worked in the office in the lunchtime. I, you know, um, my sergeant would uh, make me do push-ups every hour on the hour for 25 push-ups. Um, you know, just to keep building my um, strength physically. And then mentally, I think having these people that supported me, that believed in me, that pushed me, that told me that you can do this, really helped me. So then I went back into class again, and then of course I, I graduated um, with, like started with class 94, graduated with class 96. But it was not an easy journey. Um, you know, like policing still is quite a bit of a male dominated career. Um, things are changing, they're changing for better, but being the first Sikh female police officer to join the service, I really had to work hard to show that. I had not gotten in just because of my skin color, of my religion, or anything like that. And I am very proud of that. Um, I know a lot of community members would tell me, Oh, Mona, you're a sure when to be a police officer. You're female, you're Punjabi, you're Sikh. They need people like us. And there are a lot of people that still think that's the only reason I am in there. They don't know the struggles that I have gone through. They don't know how hard I had to work to prove myself to be there. And then when you get on the job also, when you go to calls, um, you know, you feel people watch you to see, you know, are you capable of doing the job? So, yeah, I, you know, so every step of the way, I've had to prove it. I have had to work harder. I've had calls when I've gone, when I worked Millwoods, um, facing uh, going to family fights and I was very like it was very well known fact that I was divorced it was you know I'd never hidden that fact um, I was go to family fights to uh, East Indian households and where I would be told you're not allowed to come into our house you teach women how to break up their families and stuff I'm like excuse me like you know that's not but that's the perception right because i'm divorced and i'm going to a family fight so i'm going to encourage the woman to leave her husband which i've never done in my entire career you can't make anybody do anything it has to be their decision and so facing that from my own community i had a very um, select handful of people from my community that supported me that supported me when i went through my divorce that supported me when I went through like training when you know and I will forever be grateful and you know though that was that was my support system however I also recognize that a lot of that support came because my fathers and my family supported me and it's okay that I left my husband because he was abusive but if I had not had my family support or if I had just left for the sake of that we're not getting along and you know we then it probably wouldn't have been the same. Things are a lot different now, like you know, this was in the nineties now, it's twenty nineteen. It's so great when I see uh South Asian women, women of color doing so well, it makes me so proud. I like just want to like I anybody and everybody I can support, I love supporting them. Because I remember how I had like maybe a handful of people supporting me when I was going through my, especially from the South Asian community, from the East Indian community. And it's so nice. Sometimes I run into these young girls that are now grown women. They're like in their 
30s and they they might have heard about me or you know I was spoken about in their family or whatever and they all, they come up to me they say you know we we just wanted you to know that we're so proud you know we wanted to be a police officer but for certain reasons we couldn't be and i'm like okay like it it it's kind of makes me feel like i have made a positive contribution in a little bit little way because it has given a lot of women opportunities to do things that they want to do without having the constraints of the so called you know oh south asian girls don't do that or like i would love we i think we've got two more seek or uh, indian women on the job now i think the second girl is in the class but i still like i love when a south asian women come up to me and say we want to be police officers you know i love mentoring them i love talking to them and um some of them do try to do it and then sometimes you know life happens or they change career paths or the life takes them a different way but it it just makes me feel that whatever i can do to help and support another person achieve their dream or their goal it makes me feel really good it like it gives me um immense joy to see people succeed in whatever they want to do in their life yeah right i like I, when i meet fara or i meet like um my um there are these three sisters that send they run the send studios i just love it i love all these south asian women that are doing such amazing work out there and i'm like i'm not doing anything like like i look when i look at fara and i look at the send sisters and i look at the other ones and i'm like these girls are like just going out there women are just going out there and leaving such an impact in life and then i said like and my daughter will remind me is mom you've done it maybe you need to do something different now I'm like okay so i'm trying to figure out what to do next yeah you know so but yeah it's it just makes me feel so good that you know like times are changing sometimes very slowly but at least we are moving ahead yeah you know? and i think like uh an overarching thing that that we can reflect on when we look at like achieving dreams and overcoming obstacles is it's always rooted back to like self-awareness. Yeah. Like knowing yourself really well. Like even in you talking about your daughter, she she knew her morals and she stuck to them. And then for yourself, it's just like you knew that you wanted to achieve that goal, so you stuck to it. Like failed how many times, but you just knew you wanted to do it. and you hear of so many people and oftentimes it'll be like a they'll feel self-conscious of things outside of of their life things that they have no control of things that might not even be true like you know how sometimes we make up stories of what we think other people think of us mm-hmm. and sometimes just knowing yourself really really well can help you pave that trail that you need to pave Yep. So if it comes down to that, what are like five things that that help you with that self-awareness, whether it be like an exercise that you do, like a, a ritual or just an experience that kind of like really defined a, a quality of yourself. I think it has been a journey for me to find and be to start being true to who I am. it has been um and i like i have a great admiration for my daughter for young girls that at very young age know who they are um but my life circumstances have been different my journey has been different and sometimes i'm really hard on myself for not recognizing that but i'm getting there so i'm also learning to be gentle with myself because when i grew up in and i grew up in india so there was a lot of 
uh, where you were brought up to always put others first and all those kind of things and then coming to Canada and my uh, marriage life experience was so different and then having the experience of uh, being a police officer and hearing these things that you know you need to put yourself first and that was very a big conflict for myself um, feeling guilty about it feeling you know um, so so it's been quite a journey and I would say in the last three years I've started to be more of who I am and allowing myself to be that and being okay with um, with speaking what my truth is and which has cost me a lot of friendships which has cost me um, a lot of people in my life but that's okay like I was that person who was a people pleaser and who wanted this large group of friends and then in the last couple of years that has changed where I've started putting myself first from where I've gone from my best friends telling me oh you're the most selfless person to saying you're becoming very selfish and so you know um, so the things so the journey has not been easy and it's that journey where I've been spending a lot of time by myself um, and being okay with it being okay with also being lonely and I know you know this well lonely and solitude are two different things and I find solitude now in being um, alone being alone doesn't make me lonely the things that I do is I was always a spiritual person but I had not explored too much spirituality before so in the last two three years I would say I've explored a lot of spirituality uh, Sikhism is a very spiritual religion I've never been a religious person um, So listening to a lot of um, um, spiritual leaders from different faiths, you know, I find there's always that common ground for everybody. Um, meditation, I find meditation really helps um, bring me back to myself. Um, working out yeah, any kind of working out and trust me um, in 2017 I think I had a severe bout with depression and um, it was really hard to even acknowledge it and entire 2017 all I could muster for myself was to get up and go to work and just come back home and then just lay on my couch and eat a frozen pizza <laughs> so that wasn't the smartest thing to do I should have I should have or I, I no I don't like to say I should have because then you have but I think I needed it after years of stuff I needed that where I just needed to not worry about keeping appearances or showing up and being happy all the time it was okay um, but then end of 2017 and that change of 2018 was like okay enough of this you've really like it's going to be a long road back but you can do it so going that's what going back to working out like I used to be a really love to work out before a lot I've ne never never been a hardcore workout but workout but it took me 
baby steps to come back there. And then uh, last year finding spin. Um, I was so scared to go to spin. I was like, oh my God, I am like, I'm in the worst shape of my life and I'm going to go to spin and I'm going to be so embarrassed. And I was like, well, you're going to show up, right? And you're going to do the best you can. And the next day you're going to do a little bit better. And then you're going to do a little bit better. And then maybe days, there'll be days that you will not do well at all. But I promised myself that if I said I was going to go, I was going to go. Even if I didn't feel like going, I didn't feel like... But that was the time I decided that if I made a promise to myself, if I don't keep it to myself, then I cannot expect anybody else to keep their promises to me. If I don't have my back, nobody else can have my back. If I can't be loyal to myself, nobody else is going to be loyal to me. It's true. I think that's that's a good lesson, a good thing for people to hear, especially everybody that listens to this, that's listening to it because they know something about you is going to know a different part of your story or different details to it. And from my perspective, they're going to see someone who like got into the police system against all odds. And they're going to think, you know, this person has never had to struggle. Like that's just, that's the outside perspective. Yeah. And that's just what people default to. A person would look at me and my training career and they might think that I got lucky or something. They might not know just how many job interviews that I had where sometimes I didn't even get in the door. Exactly. And sometimes it was like you go and you get turned down. Like the number of trying to fold towels for different studios that I tried and got mm -hmm. shut down from those volunteer positions. Like oh. everybody has their story and it's interesting yeah. because we take for granted the journeys that different people have gone through and even like we've mentioned Farah a few times yeah. and she's the person she is because she's had yes. tons of obstacles and we forget. So to have it on a podcast where people yeah. can reflect and so young women who might be 19 can listen to this and think, wow, like just when I thought like I wouldn't be able to get through this, this kind of gives me hope yeah. that I can prevail yeah. and that there is so much ahead of me yeah. and I think that's really special thank you and I think that's so like I remember when um, Shazia uh, was making a short film by my name and she came up to me and she said I really want to make a short film about you and I said yeah sure go ahead make it like I didn't think she wanted me to be in it because I was like I don't know if I want to like it I'd never hidden the fact that I was divorced and I had had an abusive marriage. Um, but I just thought that she would take the story and she would take somebody else and that she would make this movie. I said, okay, try and get Angelina Jolie if you can. But, you know, it was out of our budget. But she said, no, 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 you have to be in it. I said, why? She said, you don't understand. With you being in it, it will have an impact. And then I was like, I don't know. And then she said to me, she said, you want to, you should think about it. You, should, you think about it because if you don't do it, if you're not going to be in it, I won't do it. And she said, I know you do work and you speak about domestic violence. You, um, you know, you help out women that whatever decisions they make, you know, you're always there to support them. She said, but this will have a far reaching impact because many 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 people will see it and you might be able to help one person with it and she said no i know you'll have helped many people but think about it as that and i said so i had to do like you know i had to sit down and because then you become this face right like people know you but now you are kind of the face um 
and then uh, but you know then I was like okay but then she did such an amazing job of it like she took the story and I have told this before I said there are hundreds of thousands of women that have gone through domestic violence are still going through domestic violence who have gone on to have successful lives whether they have chosen to stay with their partner or leave because they have to make a decision what is the right decision for them and it's very easy for us to judge and say oh why she's still there or why she's not leaving because we don't know the whole story however my story is just a little bit unique or different because of the career choice I made and the fact that I have been vocal about uh, what I went through so that it can help somebody else. But it doesn't make me any better or any less than anybody else. I totally recognize that because I know a lot of women. Um, one of my very good friends who had no family support. She had two children and she went on to have a you went through a divorce, had a good, she made a life for herself. And then her husband, her son suffered from mental health and um, unfortunately, you know, took his own life. I can't even imagine the pain she has gone through and she's still living her life to the fullest. Like, I find that so inspiring. Like, but she's not out speaking about it. She's not out there in the public. But, you know, she's still living her life to the fullest. So, like, you know, like, I've, I know people say that my, life, my story inspires people. And I'm really humbled by that. And I'm really glad that I'm able to help anybody I can. But then those un sung heroes that you don't hear about and you know when as I get to know them through my work or through speaking at different events then you connect with somebody and just when like I say oh my god my life is I'm going through this and my life is so tough and then you then I look at my other people and I go you know something I am so blessed you know, I really feel that with all my struggles in life, they compared to the blessings that I've had in my life, they're nothing. But they have helped me grow as a human being. Um, you know, when you're young, you're judgmental of people you gossip and you all do all that stuff but I find that we waste so much time of our energy and life doing those kind of things and with age comes wisdom with time you know you realize these things and you go I just want to be a better human being than I have been before and if that means I can help somebody out you know in what it, in whatever little way I can, I'm happy to do that. So, so that's why like, I don't mind sharing my story. Um, policing is a career where, you know, only recently we have started talking about mental health. Um, for me, it has been recognizing the trauma like of migrating to Canada with hopes and dreams that I had of them getting shattered, of enduring physical, mental and sexual abuse for a few years. Um, you know, uh, so at some point that accumulated trauma had to come out somewhere. And then it was, you know, um, it was something personal where I fell in love, the relationship didn't work out. and. All those things, I knew I was the successful person, I was, you know, a good person and all that, but I forgot all that, but that overwhelming trauma that I had in my life, that just crushed me. And that, as I said, in 2017, 
it took a lot and then to recognize yes no I need help you know and to reach out and get that help you know it was also the the years that I lost my best friends because they could not understand what was happening with me which is fine obviously you know um, I also believe that people are part of your journey and when they've served the purpose that they need to you move on and they move on too yeah right and honestly every person even my ex-husband I'm always grateful for that experience in my life too because if I hadn't had that experience I wouldn't have had the courage to leave I wouldn't have had the courage to make a life for myself I wouldn't have had this blessed life and the biggest thing that I am grateful for my to my ex-husband is for my daughter I would not have this human being that is such an amazing young woman who calls me her mother right so that's so I have to be great I am grateful for that too I like that so I have a question that I ask all of my podcast guests and you might be familiar with yes. it. So if you could give one piece of advice on how to authentically live your life to the fullest, what would that question or what would that piece of advice be? I think for myself, I've always been, and not everybody's comfortable with being an open book. I have been. But that doesn't mean that I've always shown my true self to everybody. I think we, we get very scared and rightfully so because we do experience rejection from people when they see you as somebody they cannot relate to. They might know you as a person but they're like, we can't relate to this, what you're going through right now. But if you can't be true to yourself, then you cannot be true to anybody. And as much as it scares me to be myself, I try my utmost best to be authentic with everybody. Um, one thing that, just because you're authentic, just because you are going to be true doesn't mean that you have to be it be that way in an abrupt or a nasty way you can do it nicely you can do yeah. it kindly yeah. I think that that to me like and for me it has been a journey to learn to be and I I think if I had learned to be true to myself a long time ago I would have avoided a lot of heartache but then again then I wouldn't be the person I am today so for me, I think it's very important for people to be true to themselves. And to be that, you have to be vulnerable with people. And it allows you to recognize who are really your people and who are not. And it's okay if they're not your people. It's okay to move on, let them go and move on. Just wish them well and move on. I don't know if that answers your question. It does. Not, but answers it well. Okay. So thanks for joining me Thank today. Thank you so much for having me. You bet. This is my first podcast, so I'm <laughs> super excited and Same. nervous. <laughs> By the time that this episode gets released, I will have reached 9,000 listens on the Lifestyle Chase. And I wouldn't have been able to do it without listeners like you. So I just wanted to say thank you. And you're going to be a big part of all the listeners that come in, in the future, whether it be you listening to the episodes or people that you share it with or people that hear it through your social media or word of mouth. And that means the world because it would be one thing if it was just me having all these special conversations, but it's pretty cool 
that other people take an interest in what I have to say and what my guests have to say. And it's really a passion project of mine, so I just wanted to say thank you. Make sure that you take some time for yourself. Make sure you take some time to seek silence or solitude. We don't need to be all hippy-dippy about it, but honestly, the more you know about yourself, the more equipped you are to handle the obstacles that you face in life. Thank you for listening.